If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert Harriman and this is Outbreak News Interviews. Welcome uh, to the show again and I appreciate you listening. Now, every year around this time we start to see reports of cases of swimmer's itch, around the country. Now, common lore in the media is that it is caused by duck fleas in fresh water. However, this is not exactly correct. Joining me now to learn the ins and outs of swimmer's itch is parasitology teacher and author of Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and thanks for joining me once again. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So is swimmer's itch caused by duck fleas or sea lice, or is it something altogether different? What exactly is it? It's not caused by duck fleas, but it's funny how some of those bits of lore have a a grain, just a grain of truth in them a lot of the time. It's basically an allergic reaction to an animal parasite. When the larval form of a schistosome, this is a type of parasitic worm, penetrates the skin, an itchy rash results. It's usually parasites of waterfowl and also some animals that have a relationship with water, such as muskrats, beavers, perhaps raccoons. So it's, a, it's an animal parasite that accidentally infects a human. So the, how does the water become infested with this parasite? It becomes infested when these infected animals, when their stool or urine, and sometimes apparently nasal secretions, enter the water. If the worm eggs are present in the feces or the nasal secretions, etc., and the conditions in the water are right, then the parasite can complete its life cycle. And humans, when they get caught up in that life cycle, are, if you like, sort of accidental ducks for a short period of time. Now, you mentioned the life cycle. It's a pretty complex life cycle, right? It is a complex and very interesting life cycle. When these eggs are passed into the water, as soon as they hit the fresh water, they hatch. And a little creature called a myricidium comes out. And these myricidia are very active. They swim about very actively and rapidly. And they're looking for a snail, a particular species of snail. If they find the snail, then they'll penetrate the body of the snail and go through a stage of asexual multiplication, eventually emerging back into the water as a more mature type of larva, which then swims around looking for its definitive host or the host of the adult worm. If it finds that host, it penetrates the skin, it travels to the liver, and it may spend a little bit of time there, and from there it travels to the tiny blood vessels in whatever part of the body its particular species likes to be, so most often around the intestine. There are male and female worms. They make for life and produce eggs. So when you think about it, it's strange that these eggs are produced in the bloodstream, in the capillaries of the of the body, but they end up in the stool. So what happens there is many species have an egg with a really nasty looking spine on it. And this spine serves to actually lodge the egg in the capillary, but also to damage the walls of the capillary. And the egg excretes, secretes a lytic substance, which also does tissue damage. So the egg can break out of the bloodstream into the surrounding tissue. And then if you can imagine that it's something like a splinter, you know if you get a splinter in your finger and you can't get it out, eventually your body is going to expel that splinter on its own. Well, these eggs are are a little bit like that. The body recognizes them as something foreign and gradually moves them through the tissues until they end up in the intestine and are passed with the stool. So that completes the life cycle. Yeah. Now... 
is this typically a summertime uh, situation? And, uh, it, and, and and is it uh, is is it ge- geographically? Is it basically anywhere where there's water? Yes and no. Okay. It is a summertime thing, although the water doesn't have to be particularly warm for these parasites to be surviving there. About 62 to 63 degrees Fahrenheit is warm enough. But of course you need water that's warm enough for people to want to go swimming in it. Also you need the presence of the hosts, whether it be a bird, a a waterfowl of some kind, or an animal that's infective. And you need the presence of the appropriate species of snail. So if you have a body of water where all those conditions are met, and they are mostly going to be met in the summertime because that's when people go swimming, then you can have that. You can have cases of swimmer's edge crop up. And interestingly, it's not always fresh water. It can happen in salt water also. And that's why we sometimes hear it referred to as clam digger's itch. Mm-hmm. Now, um, what are the typical signs and symptoms of swimmer's itch? When those little larvae, called cercariae, first penetrate the skin, people say they feel a tingling or a little prickly sensation, perhaps something like a mosquito biting you. Then about 12 to 24 hours later, you start to get a rash breaking out, little red pimples, which then over the next few days progress to more blisters. And it is apparently, I've never had the pleasure myself, but apparently extremely, excruciatingly, excruciatingly itchy, for many people. Now, can it be transmitted from person to person? It can't. You have to be in the water where those cercariae are and have them penetrate your skin, so you're not going to get that from someone else. But one of the ways that you know for sure when you have swimmer's itch is that if you've been swimming with other people who have the same symptoms as you, it's a very strong clue. Right. Um, Now, is this something that requires you going to see the doctor, a medical treatment? Often not. Mm -hmm. Of course, people should make that judgment for themselves, depending on how ill they are. It can be quite debilitating. I have heard of people being bedridden for several days if they have, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the rash is very, very heavy. And also there's a possibility if if you scratch a lot that you could get secondary bacterial infection. So one would have to use one's own judgment about when or if to go to a doctor, but typically no. It's like an allergic react, uh, an allergic reaction and can be treated in much the same way with all the things we do for those like oatmeal poultices and baking soda and preparations, hydrocortisone creams and even antihistamines like Benadryl, that kind of thing. Okay. Now for many years we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or email them at glymedx.com. All right, Rosemary, is it, uh, is it difficult to diagnose swimmer's itch based on the symptoms? Because there's other skin conditions that can resemble it. Sure, and rashes are sort of notoriously difficult to sort out. So it could be difficult to diagnose. However, if you have that typical history where the person's been swimming, perhaps other people have been swimming in the same body of water and they have the same symptoms, and it progresses in the typical way, then you can be fairly sure that you're dealing with swimmer's itch. Okay. Now, a question that sometimes comes up is, uh, you know, once there's an outbreak of swimmer's itch in, in a particular body of water, will that water always be unsafe? Not necessarily. Of course, you have to have that, that combination of things coming together at any given time, and that's not going to be the case throughout the year. But I think it's safe to assume that once swimmer's itch has happened in a place once, it's reasonable to assume that the host is going to return at least seasonally, and those snails are probably still going to be there. In addition, in addition a snail that's infected will be infected and release cercariae for life. So 
It's reasonable to be wary of a location that has had swimmers itch in the past, but it won't always be infested. Is, is this a concern for swimming pools? The easy answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. A swimming pool that's properly maintained shouldn't be a risk for swimmer's itch. One can imagine a situation where a pool is not maintained, perhaps it's not being chlorinated, it might be, they might be pumping water from an outside source. It's not impossible, but a pool that looks nice and fresh and inviting is probably okay. If it looks questionable, don't go in for all kinds of reasons in addition to the possibility of swimmer's itch. Right. So, so mm. this, this really ties into my next question. So prevention, what, what do people do? Just stay out of the water? Sure. Be aware. Be aware of those combinations. Uh, be aware if you're in an area where the water is weedy, where there may be snails. If you can see waterfowl swimming around, it might be a, a good idea to avoid swimming in that particular area. And also to towel off immediately after you get out of the water is a good idea because you may be able to prevent the cercariae from penetrating the skin if you towel off quickly enough. Okay, very good. And now to uh, the highlight of the interview. Mm -hmm. Any fascinating stories about this parasitic condition? Sure. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was a parasitologist called Walter William Walter Court. Now, this parasitologist, he was doing research on the life cycle of flukes, which is the group of parasites that these, the swimmer's itch parasites belong to. And beginning in about 1914, he spent his summers with his parasitology students at Douglas Lake in Michigan. He and his students spent time in the water. They were collecting snails for research. And they were um, specifically looking for snails that were releasing cercariae. They spent a lot of time in a particular beach pond, and every summer that they went there, they got swimmer's itch. But they had no idea at this time what caused swimmer's itch, so they didn't know why. And some of them were so ill, particularly those who had a habit of going into the water in their bathing suits, so they were had a lot of time in the water and a lot of exposure to the water. And these were some of the people that were bedridden for days. So this went on on an almost yearly basis until about 1927, when Court went out collecting by himself one day along the shore, and I, he must have been wearing hip waders or something because he was avoiding the water. But later, he had his snails in a bucket with some water in it, and he was sorting them out. And he was using his left hand without a glove to dip into the bucket and pull out the snails. And he started to notice that telltale, prickly, tingling sensation that we associate with swimmer's itch. Mm -hmm. That was when he had his eureka moment he started to wonder whether the very parasites he was studying could be the cause of the swimmer's itch. So then he isolated some of those little cercaria in some fresh water and he applied them to his own skin to see what would happen. And sure enough, he got the itchy rash where he had applied the water and felt the tingling sensation. And then he went on from there with different species of snails and with different people, including his own children, applying water to people's arms and wrists to see if they reacted to the water. And sure enough, they did. And so that was how we discovered what causes swimmer's itch. Oh, very interesting. Yes. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, you know, the different story from way back when, with uh, uh, the, the cowpox. On, on, yes. On the maiden's head. You know, just, just a... a, a pardon the pun, a fluke that they came across <laughs> this. And, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting story. Again, you uh, continue to dazzle me, Rosemary. I love the stories. Yeah. Well, thank you again, <laughs> Rosemary Drizdell, once again for sharing your knowledge on You're this podcast. Thank most you, ma'am. <laughs>